All right, what we're going to do is open your uh, Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 16. And um, because of Thursday night and the special message that I did on Thursday night, that the Lord uh, kind of, uh, I don't know, guiding me into for a couple of weeks, and maybe I was a little bit slow in figuring it out. Uh, but I finally did it Thursday night. I thought it would be helpful to the church. It's called The True One Percenters. If you haven't heard it, you might want to get a copy of it. Joe, I guess we made a number of copies of it somewhere back there. And um, if possible, we'll try and get it up on the web and so you can listen to it. It really is meant for King James Bible believers, what I did Thursday night. And the Lord's been working with me for a couple of weeks on it, and uh, I finally did it. But because of that, I did not teach Deuteronomy Thursday night, and we have to stay on pace in Deuteronomy. The, the food series can be pushed back, but Deuteronomy I can't afford to push back. So we're going to do Deuteronomy chapter 16 in the uh, Sunday school, and then we'll do uh, 1 Corinthians 15 in the main service. So here we are in Deuteronomy 16. And um, as you've been working our way through the book of Deuteronomy, we remember that this is Moses' final month of being with the children of Israel. And he's, he's giving to the children of Israel the law a second time. Deutero, the second, know me law. The second giving of the law. And uh, I, I love the book of Deuteronomy because like in one book, you can get an idea of what God did in the first four books. It's like a compendium, uh, an editorial version of what God did in the first four books, uh, Genesis, Exodus, um, uh, Leviticus and Numbers. And curiously, uh, now, that, now these people needed to hear the law a second time. We all need to hear the word of God a second time, maybe a third time, a fourth time, many, maybe many times. As a matter of fact, in the main service you'll see today, <laughs> I finally got an understanding to, to 1 Corinthians 15 and a couple of verses that I've taught wrong before my whole life. And, and the Lord finally gave it to me this morning about 8 o'clock. So we need to hear the word uh, over and over, you know, to get it right. Uh, because we just, you know, we're, we're fallen creatures in bodies of flesh and still bodies of sin. And the light is pure. And, and when it comes through us, it it kind of gets boggled up in, in our reception. And so we need to get it over and over and over so the Lord can finally filter that light into us. So Moses is giving this law to the folks a second time orally, committing it to paper, and then they're expected to read it every single year at tabernacles and to read it in the synagogues. We need to hear this over and over. One of the things we'll observe is that some of the chapters in Deuteronomy are, are almost repetitive chapters of that which has occurred before in the scriptures. So when we read Deuteronomy 5, it was essentially Exodus chapter 20. When we read Deuteronomy 14, it was essentially Leviticus chapter 11. What you're going to read today in the 16th chapter is, is a distilled version of Leviticus chapter 23. Okay, So you probably remember Leviticus 23. That was one of the big chapters in the Bible to understand and to get a hold of is where the Lord in the 23rd chapter of Leviticus explained to the nation of Israel, these are my feasts. And then he laid down in the 23rd chapter of Leviticus, the seven feasts of the Lord. And here they are up, up here. And, um, I put the my up there because when the Lord gave them to the nation, he explained they're my feasts. And if you go back and get the Leviticus teaching, uh, the Lord would like to remind us that all relationship with him is centered in him, directed by him, and works back toward him. In other words, it's not ours. These are not the nation of Israel's feasts. They got to celebrate them, but they're God's feasts. Um, the thing you're holding in your hand, you get to read it, but it's God's book. It's, it's not really your book. Now, it's, it's intended for you, and you're permitted to read it, but it's God's book. And, and the thing the Lord's trying to teach the nation through the feast and teach us through the book and teach us through all the stuff is that he is preeminent. He's the Lord. We're the servants. We're the subjects. We're the children. We, we don't have license or liberty to come up with our own feasts or write our own books. That's one of the things he'd like to teach. Uh, 
Someday we may get that. <laughs> no, maybe not. Anyways, now, these seven feasts that he gives here, I break them down. There are three feasts in month number one. The Lord's Passover is in the first month immediately followed by the Feast of Unleavened Bread in the first month, containing therein the first fruits of the harvest in the first month. And then in the last month, you see uh, Feasts of 5, uh, 6, and 7, the Memorial of Trumpets in the seventh month, followed by the Day of Atonement in the seventh month, followed by the Feast of Tabernacles in the seventh month. And then in the middle of all that, uh, all by itself in month number three, is the holy season of the Pentecost. It's a, a little feast in there of Pentecost, which is actually a New Testament word. It's found in the New Testament. It'll be called the Feast of Weeks in the Old Testament. Now here in Deuteronomy chapter 16, Moses will rehearse, repeat, reiterate, give a second time these particular feasts. And he'll do it more uh, bringing it down cookies on the lower shelf to the people's level because Leviticus 23 is more to the priest's level. There were a lot of particulars that the priests were expected to obey in the big seven, if you will. But it distills down in this chapter to a remembrance of three feasts to the people. Sometimes seven goes to three goes to one. It's the way the Lord, the Lord does interesting things with prime numbers that way. So we just kind of pay attention and we don't fully understand, but we grasp a few things along the way and our computer guy gets it and, and we, we're happy to get a few things that we get along the way. So why don't we uh, go through this chapter and see how Moses repeats and reiterates and rehearses these particular uh, feasts of the Lord, uh, really distilling it down to the big three. Verse number one, observe the month of Abib, and keep the Passover unto the Lord thy God. For in the month of Abib, the Lord thy God brought thee forth out of Egypt by night. Thou shalt therefore sacrifice the Passover unto the Lord thy God of the flock and the herd in the place which the Lord shall choose to place his name there. That's something new. That was not spoken before in the book of Leviticus. Because now, as they're on the border of, uh, of the promised land, on the east side of Jordan, getting ready to go in, what Moses is telling the people is get ready for more revelation from God. In other words, God's not done speaking with you. In other words, God is not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. He's going to continue to go on with you. He's going to give you more revelation. Well, well amen. amen. Can the church get a hold of that, please? Instead of talking about dead manuscripts a long time ago in Hebrew and Greek, could the church wake up to the fact that God moved along with the church and guided the church over the last 20 centuries? Amen. Well, I wish they would. And this is a precept the Lord is laying down early on in the book. If you read the book, one of the things the Lord would like you to do when you read the book is, and it is good to be literal, and I'm, I'm literal, and it's good to be grammatical, and I'm grammatical, and it's good to be historical, and I'm that too. Yesterday at the wedding, uh, in the reception, there was a guy sitting down with me who was a Christian, and um, I just opened my Bible and started teaching him. And as we were reading through, I was showing him a few things. He said, I've never seen that before. And he said, I don't even understand what that sentence means. And I said, well, it's a sentence that's a compound sentence with an appositive in it. I've never heard of that. I said, well, let me explain it to you grammatically. And then he said, oh, I get it. I get it. Now, look, and it is good to be grammatical and historical and literal. But can we also be practical and spiritual and real and understand that God's not dead and finished with us and is progressively revealing things to his people? The light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. Let me, let me bring it forth to a practical application for the church of Jesus Christ, which I think you all might get. But if this goes out anywhere else, it might help them. God wasn't just finished with the people of Israel on this side of Jordan. He was going to reveal more as they moved into the promised land. God wasn't just finished 
with John the Revelator at Patmos, and that's it, and now it's sealed in Hebrew and Greek. God was going to choose a place, moving down the quarters of time, where he would move his name. I think if you have an English Bible, you have it. It's called a King James Bible. God would choose Jerusalem as God chose the King James Bible to place his name there. Amen. And furthermore, after Jerusalem was built and the temple was built, people individually went to that temple and worshipped and related to the true God. Just as today people individually come to this book and relate to and worship the true God. I, at least I hope that's how it is in your own life. Just a principle trying to show you along the way. God's not done. God's alive. God's still willing. Is anybody, anybody like to know him? The poor guy yesterday at the table says to me, well, I don't think we can know any of these things. I, I don't think we can know this. Uh, the Lord might not come back for, I don't know how long, a thousand years. I said, well, no, actually, let's take a look at some things in the scriptures. We might be able to narrow this down a little bit. Uh, he revealeth his secrets unto his servants, the prophets. Are you willing to serve him? Are you willing to prophesy for him? Then he might reveal some things to you. But he'll give it to you if you're showing an interest in coming on to him. In the place which the Lord shall choose to place his name there. Verse 3, Thou shalt eat no leavened bread with it. Seven days shalt thou eat unleavened bread therewith, even the bread of affliction. For thou camest forth out of the land in Egypt in haste, that thou mayest remember the day when thou camest forth out of the land of Egypt all the days of thy life, and there shall be no leavened bread with thee in all thy coast seven days, neither shall there anything of the flesh which thou sacrifice the first day at even remain all night until the morning. Thou mayest not sacrifice the Passover within any of thy gates, which the Lord thy God giveth thee, but at the place which the Lord thy God shall choose to place his name there, there thou shalt sacrifice the Passover at even, at the going down of the sun, at the season that thou camest forth out of Egypt. And thou shalt roast and eat it in the place which the Lord thy God shall choose. And thou shalt turn in the morning and go unto thy tents six days. Thou shalt eat unleavened bread. And on the seventh day shall be a solemn assembly to the Lord thy God. Thou shalt do no work therein. And so the Lord tells Moses to tell the children of Israel, okay, we've traveled in the wilderness, and in the wilderness we've all gathered around this tabernacle. And it was very easy for all of you at the times of the feasts when we celebrated Passover to come to the tabernacle. But now you're going to be spread out for miles and miles. And, and Asher's going to be way up there at the coast over by Phoenicia. And the tip of Judea is going to be way down there by the going out to the Sinai Peninsula. And we're going to have some people on the east coast like Reuben and uh, Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh. We're going to have some people out on the uh, west coast by the sea like the tip of Dan over there. And, and yet, God says, when it's time for that feast, you can't celebrate that feast where you are. You have to come to God. Sunday morning, where are you? You come to the place where God has chosen. You don't stay home on Sunday morning and say, I worship the Lord my own way. I got my Bible here. I'll read a little Bible. I'll watch a little evangelist on TV. No, you come to the place that God has chosen. Amen. Jesus said, I will build my church. Well, I'm, I'm born again. Well, I'm an Israelite. And I'm a member of the tribe of Dan. And I got a real nice spread here on the Mediterranean Sea. And I've built an altar here. And I'm going to do my Passover right here. In your mind, the Lord says. I'm not attending to it. I'll do the choosing. You'll either obey or go around in the folly of your own mind saying the Spirit led you to do something and, and you can convince yourself and maybe a few dumb people that haven't written the Word of God and read the Word of God, but I'll tell you, you're going to do it my way or the low way. And you'll be brought low for your disobedience. And so the Lord is just explaining the reality to his children. He's the father. Hey, it's Father's Day. He's the father. He calls the shots. He will tell you how and when and what way you'll worship. Amen. I have no problem with that. 
I should get a lot of amens. Everybody should love that. Go back to um, verse 3. Thou shalt eat no leavened bread with it when you're celebrating the Passover. Now the Passover we're going to see will be fulfilled in Jesus Christ who is our Passover sacrifice for us. And when we are celebrating the Passover, we are remembering what the Lord Jesus Christ did at Calvary's cross, where his body was broken for us and his blood, blood was shed for us. We're not thinking about a lamb like the Jews. But during the time of that Passover, they were to eat unleavened bread. No leavened bread. Seven days shalt thou eat, verse 3, unleavened bread therewith, even the bread of affliction. Is, does that make sense to you? Is that how you'd set up your worship service? Would you have your people, now, now just think about it, let's think it through. Have your people eat the bread of affliction when they're celebrating the first most important feast? Wouldn't you rather give them like a nice cream puff with chocolate frosting on the top? Wouldn't that be nice? Or one of those big, fat, gut-busting donuts? <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? Now, why would the Lord choose the bread of affliction? Now, what is the unleavened bread today? I think I see something. Yeah, someone's holding it up in the back. It's called the King James Bible. And what does it do? It afflicts you and me for what we are in our natural man. It doesn't pet us. It doesn't compliment us. It doesn't puff us up. It doesn't put a lot of sugar and honey and frosting on it. It tells the truth. By nature, you go astray. By nature, you do the wrong thing. Now, please, folks, and this goes for me, okay? So I wish I had a mirror. Mike, by nature, you did, that's right. By nature, Mike does the wrong thing. By nature, Mike is the wrong husband. By nature, Mike is the wrong father. By nature, Mike is the wrong son to God. By nature, Mike is the wrong friend and brother to those in the church. By, by nature, Mike is the wrong preacher on the streets. Everything by my nature is wrong. And I have bread of affliction to remind me of that and rub my face in it so I don't get high-minded and heady because this is the Lord's Passover and this is the Lord's unleavened bread. Every single one of us, if you're going to go serve the Lord, you better get down with the bread of affliction and let the Lord show you how to do it His way and not yours. Amen. That's, that's real important. I've done it wrong. I've done it wrong. And I've needed the bread of affliction to remind me that I did it wrong. Not some puffed up bread that made me feel, good man, good, good boy, Mike, you go out and keep doing it your way. After all, wisdom is justified of her children. Yeah, I know that saying. I understand what it means. And wisdom is justified of her children. And wisdom justifies her children when it's applied to her children. And her children need the bread of affliction to have it properly applied. Re proofs of instruction are the way of life. And that's the bread that God gives us. That's why that book that that man held up in the back is ignored by the church. Because that book doesn't puff up the Christian or the child of God. That book afflicts the child of God. Now, not in a rough way, but in a way that's needful, in a way that cleanses, in a way that combs properly, in a way that rightly orientates, in a way that puts him back on the narrow path heading toward Jesus Christ. It's the bread of affliction. That's what God's people need to eat. You know what they've done? They've thrown it out. You know what's in our coast nowadays? Leavened bread. And you'll hear it out of the mouths of our brothers and sisters. But I like the leavened bread better. I know you do. Now, they don't say it like that. They say, I like my NIV. I like my message Bible. I like this new translation. Of course, it's got saccharin, it's got sugar, it's got sweetener in it. It doesn't remind you how low you are, and it doesn't show how high Jesus Christ is. It doesn't accurately reflect the Passover work of Christ. 
all of a sudden it allows you to think you can do some work. You'll do no work there, and God says, no work. No work. But I'm serving the Lord. I'm doing good works. Well, <laughs> the reality is, the lower down you get, the more Christ comes in you, and the more Christ does the work through you. You and I really can't serve the Lord in our own strength, in our own power, our own might. It's not by might, not by power. It's by God's Spirit through the Lord Jesus Christ. And that same verse comes out of a chapter, Zechariah 4, which talks about the Word of God. Which, interesting, everybody wants the Spirit without the Word. You can't have it. So, so the Lord, the first thing he wants to remind these children is these are going to be my feasts, they're going to be done my way, they're going to be done according to my proscription, and they'll be accepted by me. <laughs> Genesis chapter 4. If thou doest well, right? Shalt thou not be accepted? Cain, you brought the wrong sacrifice, the wrong way, not the way I prescribed it. But it's the best I could do, Lord. I mean, I've put all my heart and soul and life and strength. These are the best things I could bring to you. And the Lord says, well, it's my Passover. It's not yours. And the best you could bring is a filthy rag. You need my Passover, my unleavened bread. It's the bread of affliction. So, so he's trying to humble this, this people. He, to walk humbly with our God is a good way to do that. Humbly. Next feast. Verse 9. Seven weeks shalt thou number unto thee. Begin to number the seven weeks from such time as thou beginnest to put the sickle to the corn. That means the first fruits. So Pentecost will begin at first fruits. The counting of Pentecost will begin from first fruits. Now, he just didn't speak about it in this chapter, but back in the 23rd chapter, he explains that in the middle of the week of unleavened bread, in the midst of that week of unleavened bread, on the day after the Sabbath, on that Sunday, God would bring the first fruit forward as a token of his care for that nation, a land with milk and honey, a land where they would be fed. And so every year they could count on the harvest beginning at first fruits on that day, in the middle of the unleavened bread week, uh, on that uh, Sunday after the first Sabbath, whenever that week fell, sometimes it fell from a Monday to Monday. If it was a Monday to Monday, it would be the Sunday before the Monday. Sometimes it was a Wednesday to Wednesday, it'd be in the middle of the week. Sometimes it was a Friday to Friday, it would be that Sunday right after that Friday. But right then, God would faithfully bring forth the harvest. Now, the sad thing is they forgot who was bringing forth the harvest. They thought the earth was doing it, and it just came automatically. And if they just sowed and if they watered, it would come forth, and God have to teach them in the book of Hosea and other books. You know, I've given cleanness to your teeth, and I've given you famine because you've forgotten I'm the one that brings forth those first fruits. But every week of unleavened bread, on that Sunday, the first fruits of the harvest would come forth. And God says, from that day, start counting. Begin to count from the first fruits. And count forward seven weeks you number. Verse 10. And thou shalt keep the feast of weeks unto the Lord thy God with a tribute of a free will offering of thine hand which thou shalt give unto the Lord thy God according as the Lord thy God hath blessed thee. And so in month number three, they would count seven weeks forward, 49 days. And then the day after that, on the 50th day, they would celebrate what would be called the Feast of Weeks, and it's real curious, it was the only feast that wasn't a week long. Tabernacles is a week long, Unleavened Bread is a week long, but this feast is not a week long, it's one day, and they call it the Feast of Weeks because it's counting seven weeks. Seven times seven, it's God's completion, and he's having them come forth here, and this is actually uh, the beginning of the harvest. And on this particular day, the Feast of Weeks, the full harvest would start coming in. A large, large harvest would come in across the land and they would celebrate it on this one day, on this Sunday, they would celebrate the Feast of Weeks every single year, year in and year out. And then the last, and that's in the third month. 
And then finally, in chapter 16, verse 11, begins the last month, the big month. And he says, And thou shalt rejoice before the Lord thy God. Remember back in the third verse, you had affliction. Now, in the 16th chapter, the 11th verse, you have rejoicing. And the rejoicing comes here because this is going to begin the great feast of tabernacles. And this was their big feast. This, this feast was like thanksgiving to them. And, uh, verse, and thou shalt rejoice before the Lord thy God, thou and thy son and thy daughter and thy manservant and thy maidservant and the Levite that's within thy gates and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow that are among you in the place which the Lord thy God hath chosen to place his name there. And thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in Egypt and shalt observe to do these statutes. And thou shalt observe the feast of tabernacles seven days after that thou hast gathered in thy corn and thy wine. And at the very end of the year, what would happen in the seventh month, in that seventh month there, would come the, a full harvest started. It was the barley harvest that started in Pentecost. And it would roll through. And then the full wheat harvest would come in with the gleanings and tabernacles. And they would observe the Feast of Tabernacles seven days after thou hast gathered in. It's all completed now. All the corn, all the wine. And thou shalt rejoice in thy feast. Thou and thy son and thy daughter and thy manservant and thy maidservant and the Levite and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow that are within thy gates seven days days shalt thou keep a solemn feast unto the Lord thy God in the place which the Lord thy God shall choose because the Lord thy God shall bless thee in all thine increase and in all the works of thine hands therefore thou shalt surely rejoice 1616 16, here's the key three times in a year shall all thy males appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose in the feast of unleavened bread and in the Feast of Weeks, and in the Feast of Tabernacles, and they shall not appear before the Lord empty. Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing of the Lord thy God, which he hath given thee. And these were the three big feasts. And Jesus' custom was, three times a year, no matter where he was, if he was on an itinerant mission way up in the north, preaching, and it would get near time to a feast, he would turn around, and he would head back to Jerusalem, Go to that feast, then turn around, go back and do more preaching, head back to the next feast. And he faithfully observed all three of the feasts. He kept the law. I can't say that about every Jew. As a matter of fact, as you read through the history of the nation, you will find the one feast that seemed to be ignored more than any was the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of Pentecost. It was very common for the average Jew to celebrate Passover, celebrate tabernacles, and just ignore weeks. After all, it was just a short. It's only one day. And we're in the middle of getting our full harvest. It's just starting to roll in. And there's a lot of agriculture business that I got to take care of. And that was the one that tended to be ignored by the Jews. But the Lord gave the command three times in the year shall all appear. Now, the thing about the feasts is the feasts are God's feasts. And they were related to the nation Israel but more importantly, they're related to the work of Jesus Christ. Every one of these feasts has a, a connection, is a type, is a shadow of Christ and his person and his work. If you look at these feasts of the Lord, we'll look at the spring feasts first. Months one. You've got the Passover on day 14. Historically, the nation would celebrate by slaying the lamb. And God said, you celebrate the Passover to me, you shed the blood of the lamb, you come together as a nation, and the Lord uh, accepts this as a sweet-smelling savor. But doctrinally, it's the picture of the full redemption by the lamb of God and the shedding of his blood, the lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. And the scriptural reference to that would be 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 7. And so the Passover was pointing forward, something they were practicing over and over and over, looking forward to the fulfillment, which would be fulfilled in Christ, our Passover sacrificed for us. The Feast of Unleavened Bread. Unleavened bread would separate them from anyone else. Nobody eats unleavened bread. I mean, 
do you have you ever eaten unleavened bread? Actually, I kind of I kind of eat it. I kind of strange that way. Uh, my wife buys me these unleavened flat cracker matzahs. And sometimes that's what I'll have as a snack. I'll take one of those unleavened breads and I'll put a little butter and a little honey on it. It's a very good uh, snack. And it's actually wholesome and healthy for you. But for the most part, people don't eat that stuff. It's, it's almost like eating cardboard, even the best ones. What are the ones you buy for me, Manischewitz? I think the Manischewitz. Uh, and, and even the best. I mean, if you just, I'll, I'm, get, I'm acquiring a taste for them because I don't have many taste buds. So, but, but unleavened bread. But it separates the nation from all other nations in their dietary manner. We're separated from all other people in our spiritual diet. The average person in the United States of America, his spiritual diet consists of a newspaper. That's his daily bread. And if you go to the workplace, there they are with the newspaper and all the dirty ink. And it's dirty. I mean, it's full of covetous ads of stuff that nobody needs. It's full of dirty stories about sinners doing all kinds of dirty things that they ought not to do. Full of articles about liars that are either salesmen or politicians or whatever that are lying to you. And that's their dirty Bible they read. And somehow they get pleasure out of it. I don't know, there's comic strips and sports in there and, and some entertainment and so maybe that's what they like. That must be the frosting for them. I don't know how you can get any enjoyment out of the other stuff. Do you really enjoy reading about the people running the nation? Do you enjoy reading about some of the things that go on and the scandals and the business world? Do you, do you like that kind of stuff? Do you go, why, that was great. I can't wait to read about that tomorrow. Didn't it make it kind of sick? But so I don't know why they read it. It must be the sugar in there and the comic strips and, and the stuff like that that they read. But that's their, that's their diet. But we're separated. We have unleavened bread. That's our diet. It's the bread of affliction. It doesn't constantly tell us how great we are, like the newspaper will be enticing. You deserve it. You ought to have it your way. You're really good people. You're the, you're the finest people. The, Buffalo is the best city in the nation, says the Buffalo News. Record. You go to Chicago, and Chicago is the greatest city. We're the greatest people here. And we're the greatest sports fans over in Dallas. And, and they're always petting and complimenting the readers thereof. Not the bread of affliction. We have an unleavened diet. And that unleavened, it's not only our, our food, it represents our separation, and it's a portrait of the sinlessness of Christ. He's unleavened. And, and when you read a King James Bible, Christ is sinless. Now, when you read a new Bible, I can't make that guarantee for you. I mean, someday we were doing a Bible study at our house, and I pulled out, was it the Living Bible? Remember, sister? And I read what they said about Jesus in the Living Bible, about how he got in a brawl with his friends and got in a fight. I don't know if he was hopped up on beer or whatever, but he got in a big fight one day and got some wounds and scrapes. That's sin. That's the Living Bible. And you read the NIV, and he's a sinner. When you read Matthew 5, 22 and compare it to Mark 3, verse 5, and it makes Jesus a sinner. But not in this book. This book's unleavened. Christ is sinless. Christ is separate. Hebrews 4, 15. Our high priest is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, higher than the heavens. That's our high priest. Fulfilled in Christ. And then, of course, there's the first fruits. During that week of the unleavened bread, which came right after the Passover. So here's Jesus Christ hanging on a cross for all to see Written above him, a tract, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews, for everyone to come in and out of the city to see. And there's the Lamb of God taking away the sin of the world. And then begins the very next day, unleavened bread. And then three days later, that Sunday falls. And on that Sunday, God brings forth the first fruits, the beginning of a harvest. What is it? It's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because he's the firstborn from the dead. And since he's the firstborn from the dead, that's your promise. You're going to be resurrected from the dead because he's just the first fruits. Amen. You and I are going to be part of the full harvest coming later on. We're going to see this in the second session, which is 1 Corinthians 15, when we see the timing of this thing. But we're part of the full harvest, but he's the first fruits. And just like the nation knew when the first fruits come, 
the harvest is coming. Well, the first fruits has come. Folks, the harvest is coming. Amen. And we're a part of it. And then comes that uh, middle feast all by itself in the third month, which fell around the sixth or the seventh or eighth day of the third month. It all depended on when it fell there in, uh, in the unleavened bread week. And uh, that would be the fullness of the harvest. And the fullness of the harvest for us is the fullness of Christ. Now, he said, if I go away, I will not leave you, if it will, comfortless or orphans. I will send another comforter unto you. And I will give you the infilling of my spirit, the Holy Spirit. And so this represents the fullness of the harvest and the filling of the Holy Ghost, which was filled in typology in Acts chapter 2. And we're going to look at that a little bit today also. In Acts chapter 2, when the fullness of time had come then, and it was the Feast of Pentecost, the word is fully come. Acts chapter 2 verse 1. Had fully come. And then it came, the Holy Ghost finally was able to come down out of heaven and not just abide on a person and let him speak as a prophet or come near a person and aid a prophet in his work or a priest in his work, but actually come and enter in and abide and fill a person. And that's what we have through Christ's work again, typified by the Pentecost and the full harvest and now fulfilled in Acts chapter 2 and uh, us being baptized in the body of Christ and him being baptized in us. Now notice, those are the spring feasts. Those are the spring feasts. The first half of the year. The first coming of Jesus Christ. God's prophetic clock works on these feasts. All these first feasts in the spring, in the first half of the year, one and three, those four feasts in these first three months, all represent the first coming of Christ. His death, his uh, sinlessness, his resurrection, and his sending forth of the promise of the Father, the Holy Ghost, to be in us. And this has all occurred with the first coming of Christ. The next feasts that I'll wait for the second half of the year and I'll come in that seventh month are associated, the fall feasts, with the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Going back to what happened historically in the nation, there would be the blowing of the trumpets. And the blowing of the trumpets would occur to represent a new year, a civil new year to the nation of Israel. And that's when their civil new year began. The nation of Israel was a divided nation. It had a, a holy sacred year calendar and a civil uh, governmental calendar. And the governmental calendar kicked off in the seventh month of the holy calendar. And that's when the, new, the civil new year, and they still celebrate it today, it's um, called Rosh Hashanah. So if you, if you know a Jewish person, you'll see them celebrating Rosh Hashanah, which is around the time of our September, October. And that's their beginning of their new year. And their calendar changes. Ours changes in January, they change theirs then. And so the blowing of trumpets would come and it would be the civil new year. Now this is going to be a portrait of the regathering of the nation of Israel toward the time of the tribulation when God now is calling them together and he's going to begin, if you will, a new year in the work of the nation Israel's history. It's going to be new because Christ is going to come back. And then they're going to start anew as a nation. And they're going to start right and all Israel shall be saved. And so he's getting them ready with the trumpets. And of course you read through the book of Revelation, all those trumpets keep sounding. And that uh, I know it's judgment for the world, but for the nation of Israel, for those that have ears to hear, it's their gathering call to get out of the world, come out from among them, be ye separate, follow the word of the Lord, go off to Selah Petra, hunker down, wait until the Lord comes back. And that's their gathering and that'll be Israel's regathering. And then what's going to happen when they're out there on the 10th day of the month, there would be the Day of Atonement. Yom, that's day. Kippur, that's atonement. And they would gather together and they would all come together like the Lord said. 
and the sins of the nation would be remembered. And so once a year, the Jews would come together and they would do this uh, uh, offering unto the Lord. They would fast for the day, afflict their souls by fasting, and they would think about the sins they had committed the last year. The Lord would bring to remembrance the, their condition. We, by the way, we need that once in a while. We need to bring to remembrance our condition. And by the way, I just say this. If, if you are, are real sincere with God and yourself and you bring forth the remembrance of the condition you're in, you'll be a lot more gracious to other people around you. You really will. Because you'll recognize there but for the grace of God, go I. Anyone trapped in anything there but for the grace of God, go I. When, when you really do an inventory of what you've done against the Lord, maybe this past week. You know, the altar's open. You can have a day of atonement anytime you want. And, and what's going to happen there uh, fully when this thing hasn't yet been realized and fulfilled in terms of its doctrinal prophetical significance, but what's going to happen there is that very passage I was reading for you, uh, quoting for you out of the Living Bible, but it's in Zechariah. Uh, go to Zechariah chapter 12. And what's going to happen is the nation is being regathered. And I think, I think the way the Lord's going to lead them, he's going to lead them like he, he did with me in the Bible study. Because in the Bible study, I remember when the Lord was leading me in Bible study to salvation. I mean, I didn't know half of what I knew. All I knew was that, that I was following this Bible study. I don't know why I was following it. But every Tuesday, I started coming home from the hospital and going to the Bible study. And that was not characteristic for me. You know? And I would come home on Tuesdays and sit in the Bible study and listen. Kind of like Israel being regathered. I don't know what it's all about. I'm just doing it. I'm just sitting there listening. And Israel will be regathered. They won't exactly entirely know what they're doing until this hits them. Zechariah chapter 12. Uh, picking it up around verse 8, 9, and 10. In that day the Lord shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David, and the house of David shall be as God, as the angel of the Lord before them. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all nations that come against Jerusalem. And so now these nations are coming against Jerusalem, and some of the smarter Jews are figuring it out. They're finally figuring out that Antichrist deceived us. That, that was a bad deal we made voting for him, okay? Some of them will have actually voted for him and then figure it out, and the Lord will get him away. Some of us have made votes for certain politicians we regret now, you know, and, and, they'll figure, and some of these guys are running around, and they're, and they're getting away from this thing, and they're regathering, and then what's going to happen? Verse 10, And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of not judgment and not reproof, but grace and supplication. That, that's the undeserving Israelites, like undeserving sinners that had grace and supplication poured upon them. Which, by the way, we should try and follow the Lord and pour grace and supplication on other people who are undeserving. Because he poured it on us and he's going to pour it on Israel. Watch this. And they shall look upon me. <laughs> Who's speaking there? The Lord, God, they shall look upon me. There's a deity verse. Uh, verse 4, it's the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. They shall look upon me, whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him. There he is. Father and son are one. As one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him, as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. And what will happen... In the very near future, when the trumpets sound, and we'll go up, and I'm going to explain that in a little bit, the Lord finally explained, Brother Ed, the Lord finally explained to me what that means this morning. I have misunderstood it and taught it wrong for 16 years because everyone else teaches it, and the Lord finally showed me the last trump and what this all means. But uh, what a blessing. The trumpets will sound, and the nation of Israel will go, and they'll gather, and then when they're together, Jesus Christ will come down and appear to them just as he appeared to Saul of Tarsus. 
a light will come out of heaven. It will be a private gathering to his people, just as Joseph appeared to his brothers privately. Come, I am Joseph. What? I am Joseph. Come near. And Jesus will appear to the nation Israel, and he'll show them the wounds in his hands and his feet in his side, and they will weep, and they will weep bitterly, and they will weep for their sins to know that they were part of a nation that killed their Messiah, and this will be their national conversion. It's yet to be fulfilled at the second coming. And then shortly after that will come the Feast of Tabernacles. And what's going to happen shortly after that, just as in historically it was a feast that they celebrated in the wilderness where they had their little booths and who was with them in the center of the midst of where they, where they were stationed. There was God and the glory of God was right there. And the Feast of Tabernacles is when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back and sets up in the midst of them and sets up that kingdom and puts them all around him quietly as a shepherd prepares the land for his flock and sets them all about him. And that's going to be the second coming of Jesus Christ. Israel in the kingdom, back in their nation, everyone else put out. No such thing as a Palestinian. Amen. And if there is, they won't be there. And the Lord will be there. And his people will be there. And if anything called a Palestinian, which I don't know where that came from, wants to be there, he'll have to get on his knees and say, Jesus Christ is the Lord, and be a proselyte under the nation Israel's guidance and direction, because they'll be the head of all nations. And that's yet to come. And the fall feasts are the second coming. So back to where we were in Deuteronomy 16. We'll just finish up quickly. And what he, what he finally winds the chapter up is explaining to us in verse 18... What, what the nation was to do is when they get to the promised land, verse 18, judges and officers shalt thou make thee in all thy gates, which the Lord thy God giveth thee throughout thy tribes, and they shall judge the people with just judgment. Thou shalt not rest judgment. Thou shalt not respect persons. Neither take a gift, that's a bribe, for a gift doth blind the eyes of the wise and pervert the words of the righteous. So the Lord says, through Moses, to this young group of people, when you get in the promised land and you set up your various tribes where God gives you the land, and you begin to build your villages and your cities, and you put the walls around the cities to keep the heathen out. And then, of course, you have a gate to the city, you know, where there's an opening in the wall, because you want to let people in, but you want to let only the right people in. You'll have judges and officers there to determine who can come in and who cannot come in, so you can separate the unclean from the clean, and you can keep something that's vile and perverts out of the towns. God believes in protecting women and children, he doesn't think that uh, you should have to have locks on your door. You should be able to go out freely and not worry. And the Lord tried to set that up. And the way he set that up was by putting a wall around the city and they could lock the city. And then inside there, everyone had freedom to move about. And so the Lord set these officers up. But here's the thing he had to do. He had to tell those officers, don't take a gift or a bribe. In other words, here comes a very wealthy uh, heathen, a Phoenician. Here comes a very wealthy son of Esau. And he doesn't know the Lord, doesn't worship the Lord, not interested in the Lord, but he's very wealthy. And he'd like to come into that little village and do some commerce. He said, well, you, you can't come. I mean, after all, you're not a worshiper of the Lord. If you want to proselyte and learn how to worship the Lord, then you can come in and be amongst this town and this village here. But otherwise, no, you stay out because we're separated under the Lord. You're going to bring in different gods. You're going to bring in different ways of eating. You're going to bring in different ways of living. No, we don't want this. And I said, well, but, <laughs> you know... I understand what you're saying, but you know, how much do you make being a judge here in this gate? Civil service, huh? You pay taxes on it, don't you? Pension's not all that good. You know, I got a little money under the table here. Nobody, as a matter of fact, I always pay my salesman 10%. So you're actually, we're working a deal out here. And this is how the love of money, you can't serve God and mammon. And the Lord's laying the principle down right here for the men to protect the cities. Now, look, I don't expect politicians to live up to the Word of God. Like we were talking at the table yesterday, the, the one gentleman was so upset. He says, 
they, they, they ignore the Constitution. And I said, well, that's a lower form of sin. The greater form of sin is they ignore the Bible. Okay? I mean, a man is more spiritual than he is physical. The physical only lives 60, 70, 80 years. The spirit has a potential to live for eternity. And even if it doesn't live for eternity, it's going to live at least a thousand or so years until God deals with it in judgment. I mean, so he's more spiritual than physical. If he ignores the spiritual word, are you surprised? If he ignores the word of God, are you surprised he ignores the word of men? Of course I'll ignore the word of men if there's something I can, you know, feather my pillow with. Why do you think these people, most of them, run for office? And it's nice once in a while when a self-made man runs for office because you can't buy him, he's already taken care of. But when you get these professional politicians that all they do is they just go to school for political science and they come out and they start running for a low-level legislator and then a congressman and then a senator and then president and they're lifelong politicians, they got to get their money from somewhere. They're looking for those guys coming to the gates with the bribes and the offers. And they pervert the judgment socially. And sadly for us, our people have perverted the words of the righteous spiritually because there's big money in false Bibles and big money in Thomas Nelson and Zondervan and all those publishing houses. 20. That which is altogether just shalt thou follow, that thou mayest live and inherit the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. That which thou is just. That which is just and true and righteous and holy. That book you're following that you got in your hands. That book in your hands that tell you about Jesus Christ, the just and the justifier of all. That's what you want to follow. Why? Why would you want to do that? That thou mayest live. I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Are you enjoying the new birth? Are you enjoying your spiritual life in Jesus Christ? Do you have joy? Or do you just have salvation? And salvation is good. But isn't it wonderful to follow that which is just and have joy? Amen. <laughs> Baptists ought to have a lot of wrinkled lines here from smiling. A good Baptist ought to have problem with their eyes because there's a lot of wrinkle lines up there because they're smiling a lot because they're having some joy in their life. I understand, I mean, I weep and I grieve over a lot of sin that I see, but boy, I get a lot of joy having my, my wife, having the devotions we have, having the relationships that we have when we sit and we do Bible study, the joy that I have when we go out and serve the Lord and come back afterwards and we gather together, the joy of the Lord. How many times I just sit around and just think, that, gosh, I'm saved. I mean, you've taken care of everything for me, Lord. I, 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 this doesn't, yeah, there's troubles out there. And yeah, I want to help you clean them up, but it's really not my problem anymore. The, the burden is off of me. It's your yoke. It's not mine. I'm just in it with you, but it's your yoke. What a good God you are. I, I can live. I can live abundantly if I follow that which is just. And that's what he wanted for his people physically and what he wants for his people spiritually. And then verse 21 and 22, Thou shalt not plant thee a grove of any trees near unto the altar of the Lord thy God, which thou shalt make thee, neither shalt thou set thee up any image which the Lord thy God hateth. And the Lord, he'll continue. I mean, this comes like out of left field. Did you ever read the last verse of the first epistle of John the Apostle? Huh? Did you ever read the last verse? You know that epistle, don't you? God is love. God is light. Hereby we know we have love if we love God and we love... I mean, that wonderful... You ever read the last verse of it? Doesn't it seem like it's come flying out of left field, like the last verse of this chapter? Yeah. Go ahead. Take a look at First John's epistle. Look at the last verse. Out of nowhere, here it comes. God hates idolatry. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. You want to talk to him, you close your eyes and you shut out all sight except the eye of faith. You don't look to anything. You don't plant a grove of trees near the altar of the Lord, historically. Okay, This is God's altar. I don't want nature worshipped next to me, God says. 
I'm God. I created the trees. Spiritually, men are trees. I was listening to a tape. Some, some guy came to our preaching conference a few weeks ago on street ministry and left me what he thought would be some blessing CDs for me. A well-intended guy. And it was the old-fashioned Baptist revival preaching. And my wife and I listened for 20 minutes. And I was with brother so-and-so and we prayed. And I was with pastor so-and-so. And, and I was with evangelist so and dropping all these big names left and right. That's a grove of trees near the altar of the Lord. Cut those things down. I'm not impressed. Why don't you get to the message and talk about Jesus Christ? <laughs> yeah, because you know what happens? Those trees turn into images one day. And all of a sudden they got their names on the churches and their names on the colleges and their names on the seminaries and books named after them and printing presses named. And then all of a sudden you see their picture, you know, a real nice professional picture of them on everything that they do and all that stuff. And there's images and the groves become images and that's how it goes. Folks, come on. This is about God. This is about his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. These are his feasts. They put a smile on my face. All right, amen, let's pray. Lord, thank you for... As you're trying to teach the nation of Israel historically, you're still trying to teach the children of God, the Church of Jesus Christ, spiritually. Help us to learn these things. It's exciting, Lord, to me to see that you have fulfilled the first four feasts and the next three are about to be fulfilled. And it's very exciting to know. And in the meantime, Lord, just help us to do that which is just and to follow thee that we may live and live more abundantly in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, amen.